Hey guys, today I have four book reviews for you. The first being Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Saffron Foer, The Countershaded Ibex by Andrew Warren, Sweet Madness by Trisha Lever and Lindsay Curry, and Shade by Neil Jordan. Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close by Jonathan Saffron Foer follows nine-year-old Oscar Shell as he embarks on a journey of grief and healing after he finds a mysterious key that belonged to his father who died in the World Trade Center on September 11th. Years ago, I watched the 2011 adaptation of this book starring Tom Hanks and Sandra Bullock, and what I remember about that movie, it was an emotional roller coaster. You guys, I freaking loved the movie. It was so good. And I gotta say, unfortunately, I think I personally enjoyed the movie way more than I enjoyed this book. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing particularly horrible about this book. I think just something about the overall style of this book, I suppose, and the things that, that it focuses on, a lot of it just wasn't really to my personal liking. Uh, because I feel like the movie had a much stronger focus, you know, especially on the little boy Oscar. The movie was all about his emotional journey, his emotional growth, his his development through through grieving, you know, dealing with his trauma and whatnot because of his father dying in the World Trade Center on September 11th. So yeah, this book, there was just so much more going on in this book that I found a little distracting and I wish it was just solely focused on Oscar's story, if that makes any sort of sense. Because what this book also focuses on, besides Oscar's emotional journey and his his dealing with his grief of, over his father's death and whatnot, this this novel also focuses on Oscar's grandparents, their story, and their story through World War II and whatnot. So yeah, there's a lot of flashbacks in here, just a lot of... I don't know, randomness in some ways with the grandparents. And I found myself not really caring for the grandparents' story because sometimes I would get a little confused with their story. I would get a little bored. I found myself not really particularly caring. So yeah, every time it would go to them, I would be like, please go back to Oscar. I find Oscar the most interesting. I find his story the most interesting. Please go back to him. Now, I totally understand why Jonathan Saffron Foer included the grandparents' story. You know, I understand it in the context of what's going on in the novel and, you know, the, the overall themes, because the overall themes in this novel are definitely life and death. How do you live, how do you deal with life? How do you deal with death? And I, I think one of the biggest things that stood out to me with this novel is the fact that everybody deals with life and death in different ways and there's no wrong way to deal with life and death. There's, there's no wrong way to deal with trauma. That the way you handle it is the way that you handle it and that's okay. Everybody deals with it differently. But still, either way, despite that larger theme that I think was present, it's like, I, I still didn't care for the grandparents' story. Just, I, every time, you guys, like I said, I just wanted to go back to Oscar. <laughs> and something else that I didn't realize about this novel was how experimental it was. Uh, let me see if I can show you some examples of what I mean by that. Like you would have some pages like this and there's only one word or one line of dialogue on the page. Or you would have something like this where there would be some infusion of color. Some black and white photographs were also heavily present in this novel. There would even be moments where you just have a random blank page. <laughs> and then when I first picked up this book, you guys, I thought someone had gone through this book with a red marker and for some reason was marking up the book. So at first I thought I had bought a, a damaged book. <laughs> but then yeah, once I actually read the book and I understood what was going on here, it made sense. So yeah, if you pick up a book and you see this in your book, it's not damaged. This is here on purpose. <laughs> 
And I think one of the most haunting things in this book is definitely this whole sequence with the man falling from the World Trade Center. And it's like a, a flip book here. I'm probably not doing it really well here on camera, but yeah, it's like a flip book almost. And yeah, this is the most poignant thing right here at the end of the novel. So yeah, that's what I mean by experimental. Just a lot, a lot of use of photos and color, blank pages, maybe a word or dialogue on one page. You know. uh, so yeah, I, I would assume you would call that experimental. So if, if that's your sort of thing, you might appreciate it more than I did. So in conclusion, I definitely preferred the movie over the book. Uh, the book, like like I keep saying, there was nothing horrible about the book. It was fine as it was. I just, me personally, I preferred what was going on in the movie, how much more focused it was in the movie. Uh, I just wish this book had omitted a few various different things, focused on Oscar's story, his emotional journey and growth. So yeah, you guys read Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Have you seen the movie? Just let me know down below and let's move on to the next book. The Countershaded Ibex by Andrew Warren follows Max Gilbert, an American professor who finds himself on a treasure hunt for a 2,000-year-old document that may help determine the safety and security of Israel against the Arab world. First of all, I was contacted by the author like maybe a few years ago. Yeah, guys, let's be for real. I cannot remember how long ago, but I think it's been a couple years. The author contacted me through email. He was asking if uh, I would like to read this book in exchange for an honest review. So I was like, sure, okay. So yeah, I finally just now got around to reading this book. I, I deeply apologize to the author if you're, you, you happen to be watching this review. I don't know if you're watching this, but if you are, I deeply apologize for getting around to this book so late. So yeah, as a heads up, I was giving this book uh, for free for a review. On Goodreads, I gave this book two stars, and on Goodreads that typically means Eh, it was okay. And that's how I felt about this novel, unfortunately. It was, it was meh. It was okay. It wasn't horrible. You know, it wasn't god-awful. There were elements that I did enjoy and appreciate, but overall it was, it was fun. It was fine for what it was. I guess there was just nothing in particular that impressed me or stood out. You know, n there was nothing that was a wow factor for me. And I think I got in my head, and this is just a personal issue for me, I guess, I think I got it in my head, ooh, I love Dan Brown books, I love that sort of treasure hunt sort of feel to a book. So I went into this book thinking, ooh, this is going to be like a Dan Brown book. And no, it wasn't. I think this book was trying to be like a Dan Brown book, but it didn't come across that way. And my three major things that I had an issue with with this novel were definitely the characters, the the dialogue, and simply the lack of anything exciting and interesting going on. There was just a lot of talking, 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 and, you know, not enough of getting anything actually done. It was just a lot of characters going around saying, oh, we're going to do this, and then it would take forever for them to actually do whatever. And I also felt like there were a few problematic things going on with de with the depiction of, of some of the women, the female characters, and also I think there was a few gay characters in here as well. So yeah, definitely some problematic issues that I had with the depiction of women and gay people. So that was kind of a bit of a turnoff for me in some ways, and it made me a little uncomfortable, not gonna lie. And like I also said, the dialogue, I just found the dialogue a little cheesy on occasion, and uh, the big thing, unrealistic. Uh, there was just some lines of dialogue coming out of these characters' mouth, and it kind of just made me cringe and made me a little uncomfortable, and I'd be like, people do not speak that way in real life. And I didn't really like uh, Max Gilbert, the professor, the hero of this story. I didn't really find myself liking him as a character either. I kind of found him irritating to be quite honest. And the treasure hunt you may be saying because Max Gilbert is on this treasure hunt, you know, something that may save Israel, some mysterious thing that's going on. Uh, and you would think this treasure hunt would be exciting, but it's it's really not. Like I said, just a lot of a slow paced action, characters talking about getting things done, but then not really getting those things done. A lot of times it felt like I was in a lecture, you know, like I was a student being lectured to about a topic. 
And I think the most excitement this book ever did reach, there is a point in this novel where Max and the, the lead female character, they do head to the Vatican to do something. That was the most excitement, but then that was kind of quickly resolved. And for another thing, every plot point, you know, going from step A to step B to step C, just every plot point had to be explained to the reader, which I felt was unnecessary. You know what I mean? An author, they need to trust in the intelligence of their reader. They don't have to explain every little thing to you. So yeah, I felt that was a little unnecessary on occasion. Just every little detail had to be explained, and that kind of filled up unnecessary time when when the writing should have been geared more towards characters and, and just other things going on, you know? And of course there is a bit of a romance in this novel between Max and the lead character, Rebecca. Uh, I felt that was unnecessary as well. There was just a few problematic things with that to me personally. Because why couldn't they have just been colleagues? You know, I would have been fine if they were just colleagues. I didn't see the need for them to be romantically involved. So yeah, that's kind of all I have to say about this book, you guys. It was fine. It was okay. Uh, I just don't see myself ever picking this back up again. So, you guys, have you guys read the countershaded Ibex? Do you want to? Uh, just let me know, and let's move on to the next book. Sweet Madness by Trisha Lever and Lindsay Curry follows Bridget Sullivan, an Irish maid who may have been a witness to one of America's greatest murders. Bridget finds the Borden household a strange one. Mrs. Borden is often locked in her room. Mr. Borden is a controlling money hoarder. And Lizzie Borden is trapped in her own home with nowhere to go. Bridget is Lizzie's only friend, and Bridget soon finds herself wrapped in the madness of this ambitious and eccentric family. First of all, I won this book through Goodreads giveaways, so thank you very much, Goodreads. You guys, this book had so much potential, seriously. When I when I won this book, I was so excited because this is a book about Lizzie Borden. We we all know that Lizzie Borden apparently killed her, her parents, maybe. We still don't know. I think she did, you guys. I think she was totally whack. <laughs> but yeah, I was so excited to, to read this, so excited that I won it. And then when I did read it, I was kind of disappointed. So if you aren't familiar with the story of Lizzie Borden, I'll just give you a quick little uh, summary here. In August of 1892, in this a small town in Massachusetts, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Borden, they were found in their, their home, brutally murdered, and the blame automatically went towards uh, their daughter, Lizzie Borden. But the thing is, after the, tr after the trial happened and whatnot, she was acquitted of the crimes. She was found not guilty. So ever since then, the murders have always been a mystery. There's always been these conspiracy theories. There's always been all these questions about if Lizzie did it or not. So even though I said I was disappointed with this book, it wasn't so much the writing, I don't think, because if anything, I think uh, Trisha Lever and Lindsay Curry, I think they had a really good writing style. They work well together. I never found like, oh, this was written by two people. You know, it never came across that way to me. I think their writing style was really good. I think for me, my disappointment, because I think I went into this novel expecting the novel to open on the murders, you know what I mean? Like maybe spend a few chapters building up some stuff, but then very, very early on get to the murders. And then I think I assumed the whole novel would be figuring out whether or not Lizzie Borden was guilty or not, you know, going through her trial, getting to that verdict. So yeah, really, this novel, you don't get to the murders until literally the end, you guys. And I mean literally the end of this novel, and I was just kind of frustrated that, with that because I wanted to see that happen earlier. Because instead, what this novel focuses on is Lizzie's maid, uh, Bridget Sullivan. It's all told through her point of view, and Bridget is witnessing 
this family drama, this this very eccentric family, because you have Lizzie's dad, who's a money hoarder, and at first you think he's really cruel and evil towards his daughter, and then you have Lizzie's stepmother, Mrs. Borden, and she's really eccentric and weird herself because she just stays locked up in the house, and then you have Lizzie herself, who has her own weirdness and eccentric behavior, and here's poor Bridget, the only normal person in this household. So yeah, there's a lot of mystery to the novel. Bridget trying to piece things together and then yeah coming to this conclusion uh, with the murders and who is responsible which I won't spoil I'm not going to spoil who is responsible for not that would definitely ruin the the intent of this book I think so I think this novel could have been a bit more exciting because I think that was an interesting idea focusing on Bridget's story leading up to the murders but yet it was so dull and boring for the entire novel until you do get to those murders unfortunately because I think what was lacking with this book because like I keep saying it was meant to be this mystery you know building up to the murders but the thing is I I didn't feel the mania I didn't feel the fear and I also just didn't really feel that tension that should have been there. So yeah, there was definitely a lack of that. A lack of tension, a lack of fear, a lack of mania. Because if the book had had those things, I think this would have provided for a very exciting story to tell. So I guess that's kind of the problem with this book. I think it could have been executed better. Uh, maybe that's just me personally. I think it could have been executed better, dealt with better. So you guys, have you guys read Sweet Madness? Do you want to read it? Just let me know and let's move on to the final book. In Shade by Neil Jordan, Nina Hardy returns to her childhood hometown and is brutally murdered by her friend George. Nina's spirit remains and she tells her story beginning with her childhood, the arrival of her half-brother, and her path to being an actress. Huh, alas, I don't have much to say about this book either. Uh, you know, there's just something with this whole set of reviews that I've been doing, this video. I, 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 they all have this common thread of being, hmm, they were okay. <laughs> and yeah, once again, another, hmm, it was okay book. Uh, I was definitely excited to read this. The cover really stood out to me because this cover, I don't know if you can tell, but there's like this dress and it's really ghostly looking. And I was like, ooh, that's a neat cover. And yeah, the, the plot summary sounded really interesting as well because I was getting the these vibes of The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold and The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. Um, and yeah, I think that is the best way to almost describe this book in some ways, but it's nowhere near as amazing as The Lovely Bones or The Thirteenth Tale, unfortunately. I think this book was perhaps kind of trying to be like those books, but it didn't end that way. So I ended up being just disappointed and frustrated with this novel. Definitely pretty bored on occasion. I mean, for crying out loud, you guys, it's about a woman. She comes back to her childhood home and she finds herself getting murdered by her best friend. And seriously, the first, I think the first maybe 20, 30 pages of this book are definitely really well done, I think. I was... I was massively invested in this book for the first uh, 20, 30 pages. And then it kind of just went downhill very quickly after that as it starts to go into flashback mode and we're learning about Nina's life. You know, she's telling her story as a spirit now, uh, explaining how she came to be murdered. You know, uh, the emotional state of herself, the emotional state of her friend George who kills her. And I found Neil Jordan's narrative, I found it to be just kind of long winded and rambling and very unproductive. And a big thing, you guys, points of view, because there's there's definitely the use of various different points of view in this novel. And a big thing for me when I'm reading a novel, if you have multiple different points of view, you better make it clear whose point of view I'm in. And that was a huge problem I had with this book. Sometimes I just could not tell whose point of view I was supposed to be reading from. And so I found myself getting a little confused and lost and bored because of that. So, like I said earlier, I just don't really have much to say about this book. I definitely just don't really recommend this 
to be quite honest. I, I think it definitely had some potential there, but it just didn't live up to that potential, unfortunately. But yeah, you guys, have you guys read Shade at all? Do you want to? Just let me know. So that's it for these four book reviews. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, have you read any of these books? Once again, just let me know your thoughts down below. So that's it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you like this video, you may like these other videos. Bye, guys.